I want you to open your Bibles tonight to the Gospel of Mark. I want to talk to you tonight about something that's rarely known in the Christian world. I want us to read from the fifth chapter of Mark's Gospel. I want us to start reading with the 21st verse. Now, I want you to, while we read this, I want you to uh, turn your religious mind off and turn your thinking mind on. Don't just, just be reading the text or just be reading the Bible. Turn your mind on and think a little bit and realize what was going on here. Allow the Spirit of God to make some pictures across your, the, the, the uh, screen of your mind and watch Jesus. Watch this situation because we're going to dig into it and I want you to get something out of it as we read. 21st verse, 5th chapter, Mark's Gospel. And when Jesus was passed over again by ship unto the other side, much people gathered unto him, and he was near unto the sea. And behold, there cometh one of the rulers of the synagogue, Jairus by name, and when he saw him, he fell at his feet, and besought him greatly, saying, My little daughter lieth at the point of death. I pray thee, come and lay thy hands on her, that she may be healed, and she shall live. And Jesus went with him, and much people followed him, and thronged him. And a certain woman, which had an issue of blood twelve years, and had suffered many things of many physicians, and had spent all that she had, and was nothing bettered, but rather grew worse. When she had heard of Jesus, came in the press behind and touched his garment. For she said, If I may but touch his clothes, I shall be whole. And straightway the fountain of her blood was dried up, and she felt in her body that she was healed of that plague. And Jesus, immediately knowing in himself that virtue had gone out of him, turned him about in the press and said, Who touched my clothes? And his disciples said unto him, Thou seest the multitude thronging thee, and sayest thou who touched me? And he looked round about to see her that had done this thing. But the woman, fearing and trembling, knowing what was done in her, came and fell down before him and told all the truth. He said unto her, Daughter, thy faith hath made thee whole. Go in peace, and be whole of thy plague. While he yet spake, there came from the ruler of the synagogue's house certain, which said, Thy daughter is dead. Why troublest thou the master any further? As soon as Jesus heard the word that was spoken, he saith unto the ruler of the synagogue, Be not afraid, only believe. And he suffered no man to follow him except Peter and James and John, the brother of James. He cometh to the house of the ruler of the synagogue and seeth the tumult and them that wept and wailed greatly. And when he was come in, he saith unto them, Why make ye this ado and weep? The damsel is not dead, but sleepeth. They laughed him to scorn, but when he had put them all out, he taketh the father and the mother of the damsel, and them that were with him, and entereth in where the damsel was lying. He took the damsel by the hand and said to her, I say unto thee, Arise. And straightway the damsel arose and walked, for she was of the age of twelve years, and they were astonished with great astonishment. The Lord bless the reading and the hearing of his word. Now there are several very profound faith principles and operations in this, and I want us to see them. The point that I want you to get tonight is this. There are some things that were definitely in common in this whole operation that I want you to see. Some things this little woman did, some things that Jairus did, that brought about the power of God to play in their lives and brought victory over the very thing that plagued them the most. Now, for some reason or other, there were only two people out of untold amount of people out there, the Bible said they were thronging him that actually got hold of his power. Only two. 
Well, man, that's the two that I want to know what they did, don't you? Uh, I'm not the least bit interested in, in studying that crowd. I want to know what they did. Now, it certainly could not have been their, their political or their social standing that got it done. That didn't have anything to do with it. Because this man Jairus was in, in a, an extremely high position. He was the ruler of the synagogue. And in that community, that would be as powerful as the mayor of the city. And in some places, as powerful as the governor of the state. Definitely as strong as the mayor. The ruler of the synagogue, in places of any kind of size at all, were usually wealthy men. Well, it certainly was not his wealth or his political position or his religious position that got him in touch with the power of Jesus. Religiously, he was on top. He was the ruler of the synagogue. When the synagogues were put in, in Judaism, it was done so in order to teach the people. And in lieu of being able to go to the temple, and in lieu of a high priest, the leader of the synagogue took the place among the local people as, as high ruler, high priest, the leader, the man that operated and took care of the thing, or what in, in our circle we'd have called him pastor or governor, only his was not only religious but a political office. Well, right on the other hand, this little woman ran the, the, the risk of, of being stoned. She had to have been broke. The Bible said she spent everything she had on this sickness that she had. So she certainly didn't have any money. And there's not anything lower in an Orthodox Jewish society than a Jew woman that's sick and broke. And it's more than just being low caste because she was unclean. She had an issue of blood and she ran the risk of being stoned. That's the reason she feared and she trembled when she stood up and told what had happened. So here you have socially the very top and socially the very bottom. I mean a sick, unclean Jewish woman. You can't get any lower than, the, the, than that socially in this circumstance because religiously she was a dog. So that's certainly not what impressed Jesus on either side of the ladder, was it? Now the first thing that I want to show you that both these people had in common that impressed Jesus, the thing that impressed God, the thing that moved on the power of God and brought it to play. Let's, let's look back up there at the first part of that scripture again. I want to show you something. The 22nd verse says, or let's read 21 also. When Jesus was passed over again by ship on the other side, much people gathered unto him, and he was near unto the sea. He had just gotten out of that boat, and they thronged him. Have you ever been in a place where people thronged somebody? I have. When I was working for the Oral Roberts crusade team, there were times that people would throng him. In fact, he used to hide all the time. He'd have to stay hid to keep people from killing him. You take four or five hundred people in one ward, I mean, they can snuff a man out just like that. They get, they get to thronging him, get to pushing after him, grabbing at him. I've seen people grabbing his clothes. I've, I've seen people try to pull, you know, just get so desperate and so, so just, uh, just mob a oh, man. My dad and mother in Detroit, Michigan one afternoon and, and we were leaving the crusade that afternoon and we were talking about it. In the prayer line, the people began to jam and throng the front end of that platform until finally I stepped over there in front of him and got in the way of him and got between he and these people and finally a very large woman knocked him flat of his back on that platform. 
If you've never been involved where people throng somebody, or rather if you have been, you know what was happening out there that afternoon. And in one, and in one of the other Gospels, another account of this, the Bible said that they were concerned about him. They were afraid they were going to suffocate him. They had so thronged and so jammed in there. But now, I was sitting on the platform ready to preach this same sermon one night, and I was sitting up there while they were having the, the preliminaries, you know, and, the, and the, so forth, and I was running the thing over in my mind, and I, I flipped my Bible open there, and I read again, and said, Behold, there cometh one of the rulers of the synagogue, Jairus by name, and when he saw him, he fell at his feet. I'd read that time and time and time and time again. Well, how many times I'd read it? preparing this, studying it over and over and over. And the Lord said just all of a sudden, said, read that again. And so, man, I read it again. It said, and behold, there come one of the rulers of the synagogue, Jairus by name, when he saw him, fell at his feet. The Lord said, read it again. So I read it again. He said, read it again. I said, what are you trying to get over to me? Well, but this time I've learned, when he starts doing me that way, to hush, get quiet, just close my Bible, and begin to meditate on that scripture and begin to look at it. And it, the whole scene flashed across in front of my mind, and I could see that thing. When he got out of the boat, the whole, this mob, this thing of a mob, began to, you know, come on him. And, you know, the Bible said there, behold, look, look, it says, look, here comes the ruler of the synagogue. I saw him coming. It was not easy to get in there. This guy was elbowing his way through that crowd. He fought his way all the way up to Jesus, and he made enough room in there to fall at his feet. Boy, I saw something. And in just a few seconds, the Lord showed me something that was very much in common with Jairus and this woman. Their determination to get hold of God, do or die, this is it. They were not looking to get there tomorrow. If he'd been doing that, he'd have said, well, he being a good religious man... He being a man of, of, uh, of kindness, surely he'll come my way. If God wants me to have this healing, I know he'll dump it on me. He never has. I don't know why you think you'd be the first one. Some man said, bless God, I don't believe in that. Well, don't worry about it. You ain't going to be bothered with it. You're going to have to believe the things of God. You have to act on them, move in it, before these things will ever be in your life. They never have fallen on somebody like ripe apples off a tree, and they never will. This man had his mind made up. So did that little woman. Let's read what she did. When she had heard of Jesus, she came in the press behind and touched his garment. Evidently, she crawled out there in that crowd of people, running the risk of being stoned, running the risk of being trampled, running the risk of bleeding to death. She crawled out there until she got her hands on the hem of that garment. Can you see the determination in those people? Can you see the difference between them and that mob? Can you? Another thing I want you to notice in common in these people, I want you to notice what they said. This Jairus, he had, he had something to say. He besought him greatly, saying, My little daughter lies at the point of death. I pray thee, come and lay thy hands on her, that she may be healed. And she shall live. He didn't say, and I certainly hope you can do something of some kind. 
And he didn't say, if it be your will, I know. But now if she dies, it really don't matter. I know that you know better, and I'll probably learn something out of it. He did not. If he'd have said that, she'd have died. He said, you lay your hands on her, and she shall live. That's the last word he said. Never opened his mouth another time. Didn't say another word. It moved G Jesus to the point where he immediately, he stepped aside from that whole crowd and started towards his house. Boy, I want you to know, if you'll say it with your mouth and mean it with the, with the, the, the faith to say, bless God, it's mine today. Jesus will immediately start toward your house. Boy, I guarantee you, he'll walk around a million men just to get to you if you'll produce a little faith. That old boy wasn't mealy-mouthing around about nothing. He made his statement, and that's the last word he spoke. Now, did she do the same thing? Let's find out if she did. When she had heard of Jesus, came in the press behind and touched his garment, for she said, If I may touch but his clothes, I shall be whole. And you see that? She already had her mind made up, brother, that the moment I get my hands on his garment, I'm going to be made whole. And I'm going after it right now. Well, now she could have sat up there. She bled to death. The hem of his garment was down there in that street, and brother, that's where she went after him. Can you see it? Jesus has got his eye set on going to this man's house, but all of a sudden... In the midst of this whole deal, somebody makes a calling on his power. And I want you to notice, they didn't make a calling on him. They made a calling on his power. And his power got the job done anyway, without even his attention to it. That faith of that woman was force enough to call and lay hold of the power of Jesus. But she's the one that put the faith out. And most people would like Jesus to come along and give them a treatment. And then they could believe something. And in one of these days, sometime or another down the road, if I ever get guts enough, I'll testify to it. Um, part of my wife's family <laughs> was in a car wreck and got her back hurt. And I was preaching a meeting in Fort Worth, Texas, and she came down there, had a brace on. Came down there, and, and I laid hands on her and prayed, and God healed her instantly. She took the brace off as soon as church was over that night. That's been two or three years ago, and hadn't had it on since. Hadn't had another lick of paint. Just as healed, I mean just as healed as anybody in the world. We were down there six, eight, nine months later. And one of them said, boy, the Lord sure heals it. Well, now, I wouldn't say it is gone. I said, no, don't give poor old Jesus none of the credit. Just burn me up. I said, but there's some, some check leg doctor down here. I said, you'd have done told it all over the county what a whiz dinger he really is, and it'd have cost you $400 to get it done. God did it free of charge, and you won't even admit it. Well, I don't know. <laughs> and I, I didn't, you know, it's taken over a year to get her to admit that God healed her. Why? She's afraid of the people down there. She's afraid to say. She didn't know anything about the healing power of God. And tied into something she didn't know what she'd gotten into. Bless her heart. She's learned a whole lot since then. And she's coming along pretty good now. Everything's working along, you know, right fine. And the Lord will go ahead and put up with such as that. But let me tell you something, people. If you're going to tie into the power of God and tie into it the way you and I are going to have to in this day and hour, you're going to have to have some determination to get a hold of it. You're going to have to declare it with your mouth and go after it. That's the only way you'll ever get it. Only way you'll ever get it. She could have said, if I but touch the hem of his garment, I shall be made whole, and said it and said it and said it until she paved the streets with it and sat right there in her little old room and died. 
There came a time when she had to get up and act on what she had said. Can you see that? Now then, there are a few things about these people I want you to see. One thing I want you to see is Jesus made her testify of what had happened. He wouldn't let that deal go till he made her testify to it. The Bible said we have overcome him by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony. By the time Jesus got through causing her to testify to what had happened to her, then she was strong enough in what she was doing to keep it and walk off. I want to tell you another part of what happened in Shreveport today. I prayed for this man last September with cancer in both lungs till he couldn't breathe. And God healed him. He, he, I, don't, I don't know really where he got saved right then or right after that. Any, at any rate, he hadn't been saved in a few days at that time. His, his wife wasn't in. She got healed of migraine headache. She told me this. said, I ain't nothing, nothing since. Praise God and said, I'm healed. said, I carried those things for years. This man was completely delivered of cancer on a Saturday night and Tuesday morning they x-rayed him and it was gone. He's still not having any trouble with it. But you know what happened? The devil jumped him out Christmas with this other thing and knocked him flat with it. And he, didn't, he was startled. Now, what's wrong? What does that? On the bed of affliction, since Christmas, he received the infilling the Holy Ghost laying there on his back. He got a hold of God on that bed of affliction. He was behind the eight ball to the point he didn't know how to get hold of God. He got healed last September down there on my faith. Can you see that? And then in the meantime, when it came time for the man to pick up his own sword and stand for what God had done for him, he just slipped in and hit him in another spot, boy, and just leveled him. One day's time, the man was flat of his back in the bed, and he hadn't been up since until today. Well, he'd been up, but not like he was today. You see my point? Jesus made that woman testify to what she had. He started her walking in what she had learned. She hadn't learned but just a little teeny bit. But he nudged her on, didn't he? He got her started. It said she did that fear and trembling, but wasn't any different. He made her testify to it. And then when she did, he said, Daughter, your faith made you whole. Go on about your business now. Can you see that? All right. I want to show you something about this Jairus. He learned one of the greatest secrets of faith that there is. The ability to keep his big mouth shut. Right in the middle of everything. Now, Dr. Stanson and I were talking about this today. In the, and we were talking about in the light of our own kids. What would you do? What, what would you do if you had started down to church or if you would started over here? And you came in here and said, Brother Copeland, my little daughter's lying at the point of death. If you'll come lay your hands on her, God will heal her. And she'll live. And I started out the door here with you and got over here just about this far and, and stopped to minister to somebody else that was walking out this way and had stopped me and I stopped and prayed for them. And say it took 15, 20 minutes or more. Time enough for her to be healed, for her to get up and turn and testify to the rest of the people. And there's a guy come running in the door and said, Brother Jones, just forget it. Just forget it. Don't bother Brother Copeland anymore because your little daughter just died about 10 minutes ago. What would you do? Turn around and slug me? Because I stopped and fooled with that other woman? Well, it's thought, isn't it? 
I know how I am over my baby. Either one of them. And that'd be one of the first things I'd think about if I had any confidence what this guy could do at all. And him stop and deal with some little old, some little old dog of a woman that really didn't mean nothing anyway. What about just whooping up on him real good? I mean, you lost everything you got anyhow. Why not lose another few minutes and just beat his brains out right there where you are? I used to think that way. Or would you just fall down there in the middle of those chairs and kick one of them about halfway across the house and go to screaming to God, why did you let this happen after I moved in faith and said what I said? This man did not open his mouth. He did not open his mouth. And Jesus turned to him and said, only believe. Anybody have an amplified translation in there? What did he say to him? What did Jesus say? Overhearing, but ignoring what they say. Now what did Jesus do? Overhearing, but ignoring. Now Jesus heard that bad news, but he ignored it. He ain't paying attention to it. Praise the Lord. He's a faith man. He don't pay attention to that junk. Now go ahead and read what he said. Jesus said to the ruler of the synagogue, Do not be seized with alarm and have no fear, only keep on believing. Just keep on believing. Don't be seized with alarm, just keep on believing. Just hang on to it, brother. We're not to your house yet. He'd already made his declaration, If you lay your hands on her, she'll live. See what he said? He didn't say, if you lay your hands on her, she'll be healed. God had something to do with the man's declaration before it ever happened, didn't he? He said, if you lay your hands on her, she'll live, and he never did not move. He just kept following him. Now, let me ask you something else. How far along down the road would you go in your faith if the whole funeral procession, all of your family, all of your kinfolks, all of your in-laws, all of your outlaws, and everybody else in the whole family, the whole neighborhood's down there, and all of them are screaming and a hooping and a hollering, Little Susie's dead! Little Susie's dead! And the whole bunch in there's a screaming and a carrying on, and your mother-in-law's a squalling, to beat the band and there's your pastor sitting over there and he's shaking his head, don't know what to do. And this old boy that's not even known there in your house comes walking in there and says, get out of here. That's all you kin folks. <laughs> That's all your friends. That's everybody that circles you of any kind. And this man walks in there and runs them all out, but you and your wife. Now, that's another thing ain't too easy to swallow. Friend, when you go to getting a hold of God, if there's something in your life that, that desperately needs changing, you may have to walk off from the whole batch of them to get it. But don't back off because God's with you. He'll go with you. They'll all be back. She playing around out in the front yard. They'll all be back. Every one of them. Grandma will be all right. All of them be just fine. And they may still want to cuss and argue and spit, but they can't deny the fact that God moved. But you're going to have to stick. You're going to have to stick. And old Jairus never said a word. He just let Jesus clean out his living room, <laughs> let him run all that bunch off, and right in the middle of it, now I want you to see something Jesus did. He absolutely would not talk about death. He wouldn't even confess it. He said, that girl's asleep, get out of here. And he moved in authority and in power. I just walked into my, my mama's kitchen one night. We'd just driven in from Tulsa, my wife and I, and we sat down at the table. She just scooted a plate of eggs over in front of me, and I, 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 I just got the first fork full. And the telephone rang. And there's some folks up at the hospital that told my mama, said, if you want to see your aunt down here, you better get down here right now, because she said she's not live long enough for you to get here. 
And and so that when when it, she turned around and said that to me, I almost had that those eggs to my mouth. And I just stopped right where it was, and, I, and the anointing of God came on me. I said, you spirit of death, in the name of Jesus, I arrest you right now. I'll stop you. You will not take her. No. And Mama jumped up, you know, and was a gin in the room. <laughs> let's go, let's go, let's go. I said, no, I'm going to eat my supper. And it wasn't because I was hungry, and because right at that time, the anointing of God had already come on me. I could have done without that food. That food was, was not my interest. My interest was the same as Jairus's. Just be quiet, be still, and believe. I believed in what I had said to Satan. I believed it because the word says, and give him no place. And I had stopped him. And the worst thing in the world I could have done is go to get up and ginning around there because it might not work. I ate my supper. The inside of me is just jumping up and down, just roaring and going in every direction. I did, I'm, you know what? Ain't none of the devil's business what's going on on the inside of me. And I don't let him know it. The only thing he's got a right to know is what comes out of my mouth. And that's the reason I absolutely would rather just be, be axed in the head as to confess some kind of a negative confession because I don't want him to know and how I feel on the inside. That's between me and God. Can you see that? I ate my supper, got up and went in there and washed my face, put on a clean shirt and tie. And all the time, I'm saying, for God's sake, come on. Come on! <laughs> she, she was wanting to go on. Get on with it. Got around there. I said, you drive. We started down there, and I started in on 1 John 4, 4. He that's within me is greater than he that's in the world. He that's within me is greater than he that's in that hospital, and he that's within me is greater than he that would cause her to die. And we got up there in the hospital, and they'd changed her room. They'd sent her off into another room, an inoperative room, just a room, and just, well, one other person in there, but they sent them in there to die too, you know, to get them out of a room where they care for people so they put somebody else and put them off up there where they could die because she wasn't going to live they said well she can't live another hour no way she could live through the night she'd been in a coma I don't know how long two or three days now I walked in the room now this is very much the same situation that Jesus had her daughter was over there right by her head talking on the telephone, talking about mama dying this and mama dying that and, and, and you know, and all that going on. And when I walked in the door, I don't know, it just jumped out of me. I didn't have time to think about it and say about it. I said, Lois, put that telephone down. Shut up that negative talk. Man, she threw that phone down like it's hot. She didn't even say bye. She just hung it up and then batted her eyes at me about four or five times. I walked over there beside the bed, and there was a whole bunch of people standing around over here on this other bed, and they was all squalling and bawling and carrying on over that and over there. And as we stood here, you know, what? Uh, I said, in the name of Jesus, he thin me greater than that. Now, Lord, shut that mess up over there. Give, give me a chance where I can operate here. And they quieted down. Standing there next to her bed, and the Spirit of the Lord rose up in me, just, man, just strong. And he said this, read to her the last half of the 33rd Psalm. She's laying there in a coma. She don't know nothing going on. And the devil said, just think about how stupid that's going to look. You stand there reading the Bible, that old lady can't even hear you. And so I reached in my pocket and got my Bible, and I said, I don't care what it looks like. I read it to an iron post if God told me to. And opened my Bible and started reading it, you see. And uh, before I got through with the end of that, he said, now read the first half of the 34th. I did that. He said, now read the 23rd Psalm. I did that. He said, now speak words of life to her. I said, ain't I in the name of the Lord Jesus of Nazareth? I speak words of life to you. He said, now tell her to open her eyes and praise the name of the Lord. I said, I, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, open your eyes and praise the name of the Lord. And her eyes looked like his own springs. They just popped open like that. She said, praise his holy name. She's a good Baptist woman, didn't believe in healing till then. Boy, she does now. <laughs> 
And Mama said, look at that thing all puffed up there right in the middle of her chest. Said there's a, a some sort of a, um, a gas pocket formed in there. That's the reason he can't do anything for her. Said she is so physically weak, couldn't operate on her. I raced over there and laid my hand on that, and I said, in the name of Jesus, now you be gone. And that thing just went like that. She said, oh, Lord, sister, I can breathe. And she's in there about another 12 hours, and they couldn't figure out why, but they let her go. Wasn't anything wrong with her. Well, now, you see, if I'd gone in there and soaked, soft soaked with the rest of that bunch, she'd probably been dead. As it is, she's down there in Fort Worth now just having the time of her life. She went out to an old folks home out there and called and said, Come out here and get me. I said, There ain't nobody out here but a sick old people. Said, Come get me out of this. I'm going home. Not a thing in the world wrong with her. No woman just having more fun. She had a little trouble, got sick, and folks prayed she got healed again. Praise the Lord. The thing I wanted you to see was the fact that that if I had not operated in what God told me to do, but fall and succumb to the things that my mind wanted me to do and what Satan wanted me to do, she'd have died. It would have been a whole lot easier down there in Shreveport today when, when we picked that old boy up. Now, he wasn't a little man either. I'm telling you, that guy's that tall, and I don't know what he weighed, but he's heavy. And we pick him up over there like that, and his legs absolutely, they'd been just as good off if he'd have had two anvils hanging on him because they were useless. I never in my life wanted to just drop a man and say, well, we tried to oh, bless your poor old heart, bless the poor bereaved wife, and ra de da de da and go make funeral arrangements and let the old boy die. It would have been a lot easier to just stood there and said, well, this must be for another generation. It's not for us. I've done everything I know to do. Your old head wants to do that. I refuse to do what my natural mind wants to do. I refuse to do anything except what I see Jesus doing in that book. So we janked him up there again. Failed again. But I am not going to budge. I'm not going to move until I get something from God. And he tells me, forget it, I'll forget it. Until he tells me something, I'm not doing it. I ain't moving on that book. He said, I'm here, I'm here. I knew I had it. I knew I had what I was after. Well, I'm about to give up at that point. He'd already told me the day before if I'd go down and pray for that man, he'd raise him up and there'd be a great meeting come out of it down. That's just exactly what I'm planning. Already got the thing going. Do you see my point? When in the world are we going to quit giving in to what your head says and just absolutely at least have as much guts as an old bulldog and not give up? After all, we're supposed to be spirit-filled, born-again believers instead of spirit-filled, born-again chickens. Isn't it so? Amen. Praise the Lord. I'm telling you, I've been whipped so many times. It don't make any difference. I'm getting where I win a few. Praise God. And, and over there this afternoon, I told Satan right in the middle of it, I said, no, if you want to hang around here and get cut up with the Word of God, that's all right with me. That's fine with me. But now you listen to this. And I just opened my Bible up there and just started laying it on him. Took the Word of God and laid it on him. Pulled the man off the bed. He couldn't do nothing. Put him back down there. Just started laying it on him again. Just, just pounding it to him in the name of Jesus. Just pounding the Word of God to him. That's what Jesus did. I noticed on the mountain of temptation, Jesus didn't run him off the first time he nailed him either. He hit him three times before it did anything. I'm sure not going to quit before three times. If it took Jesus three times to knock him off that mountain, don't think I'm going to quit it twice. For goodness sakes. <laughs> but it worked. And with the same weapon, it'll work again and again and again and again and again and again. And I'm a little smarter this afternoon than I was this morning. I learned me some few things over there this afternoon. I found out some things about the operation of Satan. I found out some things about the operation of God. And I found out where I'd made some mistakes in the past, and I'm not going to tell you what they are either. I found out a few things. I'm not going to make those again. 
Next time is a little better. Next time is a little quicker. Next time is a little better and a little quicker and a little better. I don't believe we ought to quit, folks. Can you say amen? Now, here's the, the, the finale of this thing. These people said it. And you notice that they both put their action and their words in the now. He didn't say she is going to be healed one of these days. He said, if you lay your hands on her, she shall live. And this little woman said, if I get a hold of him and his garment, I shall be made whole. She didn't say, I sure hope he heals me, or I'm going to be one of these days. Or maybe today Jesus is beginning a healing on me. No, he already did all it takes to heal you at Calvary. You got that swapped around. You began receiving today. And you may get it just an eyedropper full at a time because that's the way you're receiving it. Why don't you go ahead and stick your head under? Say, praise God, it's mine now. And I'm not really on. If it isn't faith, it is, I mean, if it isn't now, it isn't faith. If it's tomorrow, it's hope. If it's yesterday, it's in history and it's past. Faith is always right now. Now listen. When Jairus said, if you lay your hands on her, she'll live. Jesus comes along here, and this little woman said, if I but get a hold of the hem of his garment, I'll be made whole. Did Jesus stop and say, no, now wait a minute. You can't do that. I have to lay my hands on you. I'll have to anoint you with oil to get you healed. Or how about when he went on down that Jairus' house and he walked in there and, and you know, Jairus had said, lay your hands on him. He said, no, now look, back up the road there a while ago. This old coat did the job. Now let's see if we can't do that again. We're going to use this. After all, ain't nothing wrong with good prayer cloth. This thing's a working. <laughs> Let's use this. What did he do? The point of this is this. Jesus, nor God. Jesus, nor God, either one, made the declaration or the decision how or when those people were to be healed. They did it. She made the declaration of how and when she was to be healed. Can you see that? She said, when I touch his garment, I shall be made whole. She didn't say, just be healed this blood thing. She said, I'll be made whole. And Jesus turned and said, daughter, your faith made you whole. She got just exactly what she believed for. See? See? What about when the Roman centurion walked out there to Jesus and he said, Look, I recognize authority when I see it. Say the word and my servant will be healed. Jesus said, No, I'm going to have to get him and this garment on you. This thing's just done wonders the last few days. And, and I'm going to have to lay my hands on it. I can't minister to the man from here. What did he do? He did what the man said, didn't he? He said the word. Didn't it work? If you'll study out the New Testament and the Old, you'll find that every miracle of deliverance from the front to the back was done the same way. What did little David say? First thing he did was he said it. He came roaring off that hill and he said, The Lord will give you into my hand this day. And then he told him how he is going to take him. And he went and got his rock. Well, God didn't kill the man with a lightning bolt. He killed him with a rock. Didn't he? I'll tell you something else. Most people don't realize it. If he hadn't got him with a rock, he'd have beat him to death with that staff in his hand. Folks don't realize that he had his staff in the other hand. He, that, he was a professional sheep herder. He could take that staff and, 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 and break a wolf's neck or an old dog's neck or something like that. He'd break it so fast you can't even see it. Those guys know how to use those sticks, brother. He had that stick in the other hand. If he hadn't got him that rock, he'd absolutely beat that man's brains out with that stick. 
But he made his statement before he ever got down there, and then he went and did just exactly what he said. He said, the Lord will deliver you into my hand. No doubt about it. And you ain't going to be nothing but like that bear in that line. You're mine, brother. Didn't he? What about, what about the time that, that uh, Moses was to put the serpent on the pole? And God gave the command, said, when you look, you'd be made whole. Well, what did they do? When they got bit by those snakes, I, did, they, did they roll over on the ground and go to squalling and to bawling? What did they do with it? They did what God said. They turned and they looked, and they were made whole. You see, it took action. It took desire, it took obedience. But all through the Bible, the great miracles of deliverance, the man that needed the deliverance established the when and the how he was to be healed. Can you see that? I believe you can. I believe you can see it. I, I, I believe you can. I believe you can grasp that. Now, what have we done? We said, "Well, if God ever gets ready, He'll do it." He's been ready since before you was born. See, He's already ready. The expression of His will and what He wants to do for you hung on that cross. Now, I don't care what your theology says; it don't make any difference. God's will hung on that cross and it covered every form of man's union with Satan. I don't care what it is, that cross covered it. I asked the Lord one day, I said, now wait a minute, is, Calvary, is this covered in Calvary? The Lord said, what do you mean? You found something that Calvary wasn't good enough for? In fact, he got about half hot at me over that. If you want to get God touchy at you, you just go to claiming that the cross of Calvary, there's something that it didn't cover, something that it didn't take care of, some kind of a problem that wasn't involved when Jesus hung on that cross. And you got God to deal with. Because everything he had hung there. He gave everything he had for everything you had. Can you see that? So, when I establish by the word of my mouth, I have believed it in my heart and I make up my mind to it and I go toward God with it. I've made up my mind to move on it and get it. Now one thing this fellow said this afternoon, I want you to notice this. He said, I've got cancer of the bone. I'd already ministered to him. I began to tell him that Jesus had borne this, that he'd already carried it, that it didn't belong to him. And the word of God got to him. His eyes lit up. You could, it, it got, you know, it got through to him. And he began to see it. And you know what the next thing he said out of his mouth was? I'm healed. I'm healed, he said. I believe it. Well, you couldn't see anything about his body. He's still the same old sorry looking thing he was when we walked in there. But there was something different on the inside of the man, and he, already, he established it because he believed it in his heart. He began to establish it with his mouth, and he started saying, I'm healed. And the next time that we went up on the floor, there was some action took place. And this time the pain left. And this time there was some power in the man's life. The power didn't get there, and then he said he was healed. The Word got there, and he said he was healed. Now, I don't know about you, but I've learned to use the Word of God as my point of contact. I go to the Word and use it, like, like she used the hem of the garment. I've used other things beside the Word of God as a point of contact. I used a light string one night. I told the Lord, I said, the moment I pull that light string, in the name of Jesus, I'm saying it by my mouth, I'm healed, and I'll never look back on it again. I pulled the light string, hurt just as bad as I did before I pulled it. Laid down in that bed believing God. Took my heating pad and threw it off in the floor. I told you about this before. And before I got to sleep, good is healed. 
Do you see my point? You need to make up your mind and be determined to get hold of God. Number two, you need to establish that time and that place. Then you need to go to that place at that time. And then establish that in your spirit, in your mind, and in your body and begin to act according to what you have declared before God and don't ever again look back. Not ever again. Don't ever relent. And every time your mind begins to tell you you don't have it, King Kraman Scala Sisiri Bosoto, since when did your mind come into a place where it could dictate to my word and my power what it could do? It's your heart by my word and by my spirit, saith the Lord, that these great things come to pass, and when you act upon it, you bring me into play. Now that's what I said in tongues. Praise the Lord. Can you see that? Praise God. Well, say amen or something. Amen. Praise the Lord. Thank God. Hallelujah. It works, doesn't it, Pat? It works, doesn't it, Ray? It works, doesn't it, Ron? Hank? Praise the Lord. You bet it works. You bet it works. Old Ray is laid up in the bed, something wrong with his leg, and he's a hurting man. He couldn't walk and everything else, and... It is time, you know, but this time his wife is all in a frenzy and everybody's in a frenzy. And Ray Fowler said, well, Lord, you've always been my healer all my life. I ain't never seen the first doctor yet, and I'm not going now. I'm healed, thank you. How long did it take from that point? <laughs> How long have you been there up to that point? Two days. Praise the Lord. Can you see what I'm telling you? You can't lay around on this thing. You remember what happened outside the gate of the city when two lepers sat there and said, Why sit we here till we die? You know what happened to Job? Surprisingly to most of you, you find out he got healed. A lot of people want to be like Job while he's sick, but if you're going to be like Job, you're going to have to get healed. You know where Job got into action? He made up his mind in the first place. He decided out of all of this, see his wife, old bad news walked in there. Why don't you just cuss God and die? <laughs> you know, that's something you ought to think about, really, you husbands and wives. When you walk in the door, do they say, here comes old bad news? Or do they say, praise the Lord, there comes mama. Just brighten up the room so... <laughs> Think about that a little bit. That don't cost you anything extra. Just try to pitch that in there. <laughs> and he finally turned and prayed for the brethren that were sitting there bad-mouthing him. And broke the hope Satan had on him. He finally began to move in faith. He finally began to do something other than just sit there and wallow around in that mess. Do you see it? Now let me show you something about Jesus. A leper comes up to him and said, If you will, you can make me whole. And he didn't go through a bunch of junk and carry on about form and formality. He just said, I will. Isn't that something about him? Don't ever consider. Don't ever even consider operating in the power of God without you first consider the love of God. You'll never be able to understand God without you consider the love of God. And if you think God's your problem, you're much mistaken. He's a lover. He is love. He loves with a love that is uncanny. He has never hurt. He has never intimidated anybody. He just loves. He just loves. Watch Jesus throughout his whole ministry. And you see a picture of his love for his father and his love for the men around him, even though they hated his very insides. And you see him like this. He's got the Father's hand on one side and he's got man's hand on the other. 
and he won't let go. He won't let go. And if you give him half chance, if you give him half opportunity with just a teeny bit of faith and a teeny bit of love and a, just a teeny bit of the Word of God, boy, you better watch out. Because the Spirit of God will storm your very domain and the power of Almighty God will walk through your life and you will stand there and say, I don't understand it, but at this point I could care less. Can you see that? And a little more and a little more and you'll begin to understand some of it. If you wait till you understand God, you're shot down in the first place. Just grab hold of it. The key to it is the Word of God, the love of God, and the care for somebody else. Make and establish a point of contact with God and go there. Go to that point. If you want me to be your point of contact, I'll happily do it. I'll pray. I know one time I had something that needed praying for. And... Um, I don't even remember now who prayed for me. I believe my wife prayed for me. I don't remember. Anyway, I know I didn't care anything about what they prayed. All I wanted to hear was amen. I had made up my mind and I had declared to God that I'm going over and get some prayer. And the moment that prayer is said, I'm going to say amen and that's the end of that. Bless God. That's when I believe I receive. One time I went to a man that I have a great amount of confidence in in the ministry. I was in a position of indecision. I did not know what to do next. In fact, the problem involved was there was a trip scheduled that I was supposed to fly for Brother Roberts. And at the same time, they, uh, they had called me and said that they were, were ready for my ordination service. And I said, Lord... I'm obligated to both. Now, what do you want me to do? I want your will in this. You want me to go down there and be ordained, or you want me to go on and fly this trip and be in that crusade with the, with the crusade team? Which way you want me to go? And, of course, you know what happened. Satan jumped right in the middle and trying to jump me off and push me off one way or the other and keep me from making a decision and then get me into indecision, and I didn't know which way to go next. I said, all right. I got on my knees in there and I said, Lord, tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going over there at this man's house. He don't even know I'm coming. I'm going to ask him for prayer. And I'm saying it with my mouth because I believe it in my heart. The minute he lays his hands on me, I'm going to know which way you want me to go. I don't care if you reveal it to him or if you reveal it to me or if a dog, puppy dog, he comes in there and tells me. I'm going to know the minute he lays his hands on my head. I don't care how you get it done. You just got it to get done. That's the way my faith's working. I called him on the telephone. He didn't particularly care a thing in the world about seeing me. He just got in off the road. And I got him on the phone. I said, I'll be over there in a few minutes. I want to talk to you. He said, well, is it urgent? And I said, well, it is to me. I'll be there in a minute. He said, well, all right. Come on over. I got over there and he said, what's your problem? I said, oh, it ain't much. Doesn't make a whole lot of difference anyway. And we sat there and talked. Well, I don't, I'm not too particularly interested in telling him a problem. I want him to pray. And I said, listen, I've already established this with God. All I want you to do is pray. He said, you know what you're doing? I said, I sure do. All I want you to do is just pray. Lay your hands on me and pray. He walked over there, laid his hands on my head, and he said, Lord, I want you to meet every need of Brother Copeland. He said, uh, in the 13th chapter of Acts, where there was at the, at the church at Antioch, prophets and teachers praying, ministering unto the Lord, the Holy Ghost spoke, and said, separate unto me Paul and Barnabas for the work that I've called them to do. The scriptural basis for ordination. I said, thank you, praise God, that's all I want to know. He don't know yet what I found out. 
But he understands me and I understand him because we're both operating in faith and we're both op our ministers a whole lot of life. When I got through, I said, thank God. I got what I want to know. He said, praise the Lord, son. Keep walking in faith. He just walked out, turned around and walked out. Well, why keep messing with it? We got it. But you see, the Lord met me at the point of my faith. Now, here's what I'm saying to you. There is a time when it's time to get your faith out of you. There's a time when you're going to have to turn that faith loose. It's got to get into the hands of God or you don't have anything. Do you see my point? One lady one night after a prayer meeting said, Brother Copeland, I can't understand say my life while I'm not healed. She said, I got all the faith in the world. And the Spirit of God rose up in me and said, that's the trouble with it. You still got it all. Now, what we need to do is just get loose of just enough of it as much as a mustard seed and we'll get this thing done. She said, oh, my Lord, I never thought of that. See, somebody's always hoping it's going to happen and hoping it's going to doesn't never come. Tomorrow never, ever shows up. And the next day, it's going to come Sunday. The next day, God's going to heal me Sunday. The next day, I sure wish Brother Roberts come town. Maybe I can get healed in. Maybe this, maybe that. And nothing ever takes place. Nothing ever happens. Recognize, folks, that the love of God is in your favor and that he's already satisfied the realms of justice and all you have to do is put out your faith and get in what he's already done for you at the cross and establish it with your mouth and then get in it and don't ever, ever, ever look back. Praise the Lord. I know one preacher, I'll give you this illustration we'll close. I know one preacher that had two tumors on the side of his face. He prayed about it. He was in a ministry of deliverance, powerful ministry, all over the world. He prayed about that thing, laid it in the hands of God, and he said he confessed his healing, laid it there, and in the name of Jesus, never did relent nor look back. He never did question it anymore. He never did bother with it anymore. And those things got bigger and bigger and bigger. And it was a matter of years. He kept it up. He kept it up. He kept it up. He kept it up. And he got up one morning and went in there to shave and those things were laying out there on his jaw and he just reached up there and got them and threw them in the trash. Well, some of you batting your eyes at me like a calf at a new gate. <laughs> well, it's all so, and you might as well say amen. amen. Praise God. It'll work for you. Praise the Lord. Well, I want us all to stand our feet right now. Here's what I want you to do. Sometime between now and tomorrow, I want you to put this to work uh, on, on, I want you to put it to work somewhere. I want you to take account of it. I want you to watch what takes place and I want you to watch what Satan does. I want you to watch what God does. I want you to watch what your family does. I want you to watch what you do. And I want you to, I want you to notice it and take account of it. I want you to find out what's going on around you. I want you to do it. I want you to do it. I want you to do it on yourself. Now, don't just jump in here and go to try to work in it for somebody else just right off of the bat because you got their will involved. And if you're not careful, you don't know just maybe exactly how to handle that yet. Do it where yourself is concerned. You know which way your will's going. You know which way your desire is going, see. Or maybe right there in your own immediate family, you know what's going on with them. Do what I've told you to do. Establish it from the Word of God and then say it with your mouth and go to that time and that place. And watch God. Will you do it? Put it to work. Pray about it. Look at it. Deal with it. It ain't worth a flip if you can't use it. You're going to make some mistakes. Thank God for them. Make them now where we can discuss it and talk about it. Oh, I'm telling you people, if, if we just get a hold to find out what God's got in store for those that love him, you're, I mean, you, there's no end to what can take place with a man that will believe God. Absolutely no end to it. No end to it in the name of Jesus.
Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise Jesus. Our Heavenly Father, we ask you to give us a glimpse of these things. We thank you for it. We praise you for it. Now, Father, I'm leaving the people in your hands now. In the name of Jesus, I'm going to turn this off right here. I'm going to put them in your hands, and I'm going to place them there for you to, for, to deal with them and to show them as they use these things. I want you to reconcile their mistakes. I want you to show us, give us a glimpse of how this is done. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray and we do believe. Now, all of you together say, Jesus is Lord. Jesus is Lord. Jesus is my Lord. In the name of Jesus, I declare it. I shall be a success in my spiritual life. I shall motivate the power of God. And I shall be motivated by the power of God. And I shall produce in my life the love of God. For I am a believer. All things are possible unto me. Because I believe. And he is my Lord. In Jesus' name. Amen. Turn and shake hands with your neighbor and say, Thank God for the word. And you're dismissed.